uh, three friends here. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, Melvin Marr, uh, the executive producer of the pioneering television show Fresh Off the Boat uh, on ABC. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, which we'll hear more about. Uh, Fresh Off the Boat uh, is based on uh, uh, the, uh, a memoir of the same name by the celebrity chef and restaurateur uh, Eddie Wong uh, and is an irreverent uh, reimagining, reconstruction of the sitcom uh, in an uh, uh, Asian American household. Uh, uh, next we have Rashad Robinson who is the executive director of colorofchange.org. <clears throat> One of the great, very creative and imaginative forces for activating media and mobilizing people uh, in ways that are very relevant to the 21st century uh, to create uh, pressure for justice uh, in politics uh, and in the culture. Uh, and then uh, finally we have uh, my friend Brad Jenkins, who's the managing director uh, of Funnier Die DC. Those of you who are of a certain age, and I mean younger than me probably, uh, know funnierdie.com as this fantastic irreverent website that uh, generates uh, incredibly viral uh, humor content that uh, sometimes uh, is political, sometimes is not. Uh, Brad comes uh, to Funnier Die from the Obama White House uh, where he had been helping to lead public engagement. So, uh, delighted to have all of you here. So, um, I want to just open with a common question to all of you, which is just, um, in, in different ways, you're all in the narrative business. Uh, and, and I'm interested to hear how, um, in the work you're doing, you feel like you're beginning to bend or change uh, the, the, the shape and the direction of the American narrative. And uh, Melvin, let's just let's start with you. I always come to these things for you, and I always feel like everybody's doing something so mu much more important than me. We're making like <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to make a TV show. Well, four and million people laugh. didn't. Four million people didn't watch me last Tuesday. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think fresh off the boat, I, I still have moments where I was just like, wow, this is really sort of happening. Like recently, we got picked up for, um, you know, season three in March, which is early, and. I just thought, really? This is, I have moments of that all the time. But, you know, it's, thanks, thanks. It's, uh, it's awesome because I think it's, it's the rise of, like, you know, the minority voices is, is out there. And for so long, it hasn't been present in, uh, in mainstream media. And now it is in a real way, you know? And I think, you know, I give a lot of credit to ABC. Um, they've done a thing where they really are addressing diversity. They have the, you know, the Asian show, they have the African American show, they have the Latin American show. They're like, they're covering it, you know? And, you know, in, in, a, in a really cool way too, and it's not just, you know, for them, not just extending to, you know, uh, ethnicities. Like, you know, they, I'm, I'm working on a pilot now for them where, you know, I have sort of taken the advantage of, you know, the decline of network television, everyone's talking about that, and like the, cha the choices that people have in, you know, um, you know, watching things now, and I, I just sort of took it as an opportunity to find ways to, you know, feature families or voices that are sort of underrepresented. Like, my new pilot's called Speechless, and it features a, an American family where um, one of the members has a disability, you know, and, you know, um, it's based on uh, Scott Silveri's life. He, he grew up with a brother that has um, cerebral palsy, and I thought, well, that's really powerful. And the thing that made me sort of think immediately that it's a comedy is he was talking about how his brother was kind of a jerk, you know, and would always give him a hard time and, 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 you, know, and, and you know, poke at him. And I thought, like, oh, that's, that's, that's an American family. That's, that's a comedy. That's a voice. That's a point of view that it isn't on TV. And we took it to the ABC, and they just said, absolutely. Let's do it. You know, what's so powerful about that kind of, um, well, that p idea for Speechless yeah. and what you've been doing with Fresh Off the Boat yeah. is it recognizes the way, the way in which, um, you know, last night on the panel we had Maria Hinojosa from uh, uh, Latino USA and NPR and, uh, and just talking about the ways in which when you either see yourself or hear yourself in the mirror of popular culture, mass popular culture, um, it changes your sense of, again, claiming your sense of ownership of of this country. And Rashad, right. yeah. um, you've been coming at that in some of the campaigns and work that y'all have been doing at colorofchange.org, um, sometimes recognizing the underside of that same dynamic, yeah. recognizing the ways in which the mirror of pop culture can propagate negative stereotypes um, of African Americans and others. And to describe some of the ways in which y'all have been trying to push against uh, the misuse of the mirror of pop culture. 
Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, at Color of Change, so much of our work is about responding, these moments that are happening every single day, Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown or issues with the economy or issues with voting rights. And our model is to respond, to give everyday people something strategic to do. If black people or those issues are present, how do we make that not just present but powerful? How do we translate everyday people and build the type of energy? And as we were doing these moments every single day, whether it's after Trayvon Martin or Sandra Bland or some of these moments that have captured the animation or energy, you recognize that you can't change public policy without changing culture. You can't have these discussions and try to shift how the rules are written if you're not also concentrating on a mix of unwritten rules. And that's where we get to culture. And so we spent a lot of time you know, challenging Hollywood. We led a campaign that forced um, Fox to cancel the TV show Cops after 25 years and um, mobilized tens of thousands of our members. We mobilized our members to force um, NBC to never air this um, reality show that they greenlit called All My Baby's Mamas with the rapper Shorty Lowe and, a, and a, a, a disgusting sort of look at black families um, for, corporate, for corporate greed. And, um, and we kept leading these campaigns. And, and after that, we also recognized that we couldn't just be on the outside with a stick. We had to figure out how we were going to be on the inside and working on the inside to leverage the energy after we won these campaigns to say, now here's what you do differently. And so we opened up an office in Hollywood. We hired someone from the industry. And we've been building these salons for writers around the country, bringing real people's stories into those writers' rooms. This was something that I learned very clearly prior to coming to Color of Change when I led the programmatic work at GLAAD. And I was watching the rock roll down the hill in, in, in terms of culture change for LGBT folks. There's still a lot of work to do there, but I recognize how some of those strategies could translate. And right after my niece was born, I was watching television. I was seeing things. I was like, if that was gay, we would get it off the TV, but it's black. And how do we build the type of engine that not only forces um, those creative folks in Hollywood, but more importantly, um, gives creative folks who are not allowed in the door more of a voice. How do we force and change the demand structures that says whose stories get to told and whose stories don't get to told? You know, that's uh, very powerful. And <clears throat> Brad, I mean, there's uh, different elements of what Rashad just said. I mean, inside, outside is definitely, uh, you, you are now, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the outside, uh, but uh, having been on the inside of the power structures at the White House, uh, understand the ways in which, um, you know, even the most powerful center of government and the po most powerful nation on earth recognized that it was a little bit at the mercy of popular culture, right? And um, one of the things that President Obama did that you had a hand in when he was uh, trying to sell the Affordable Care Act, uh, he pulled out all the stops. Yes, he went on PBS, and yes, he spoke on NPR. Um, uh, but he also did a thing on Funny or Die. T tell us about that and about what you learned from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love how you say you're out of the, it sounds like I'm like been broke, broken free from prison or something. It's like, <laughs> you're on the outside now. It's true, I am on the outside. Um, so yeah, so uh, my greatest claim to fame was I convinced uh, the president to go on a show called uh, Between Two Ferns with Zach Galifianakis. Yes. <laughs> Not yes. sure if folks are familiar with that show. Um, it, was, it was either going to be the greatest success or the greatest failure of the Obama presidency. So uh, <laughs> high risk, high reward. Um, but no, I, I mean, it's a great question, Eric. I think that when you're at the White House, the one thing that uh, you learn very quickly, uh, and I think the president realizes very quickly, is that uh, young people don't really care. And I know that that's... <laughs> That's probably not something you want to say to this room, because this room cares. Um, but th there was a very uh, rude awakening when we occupied 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue um, that the, the, the tenor of the campaign, the hope and the change that we saw from millions of young people like myself who got involved was just going to be a lot harder when it came to the legislative push and pull of Washington. It's just not sexy. It's not particularly compelling. And so we learned very quickly that pop culture, I, I think, you know, years and months in, that's just where our community was. In, in thinking through all of the different communities we needed to reach, um, it wasn't just this abstract pop culture. It's, no, that's just, that's a community. Um, speaking of Melvin's show, you know, if you ask a young person if they know their neighbor two or three houses down, they probably couldn't tell you, but they can tell you every character's name 
on Melvin's show. So we needed to think through strategically how to leverage pop culture, right? How to really ride the wave of these stories and ride the wave of these influencers. And Between Two Ferns is a perfect example. We had a website, we had, well first we had a, a, a law that was the greatest reform in modern history. Um, and then we had a website that didn't work for two months. Uh, and we had John Stewart and Stephen Colbert making fun of us every day for two months, speaking of pop culture. And so we had to break the narrative. And the way that we did it was, I was at the White House at the time, and I really believed that it had to be done through humor. That humor was the way that we were gonna be able to, to look at ourselves and say, hey, the website didn't work, but here are the ways in which you can now get enrolled. The website works, and it worked. The statistics are pretty incredible, not to pat myself on the bat, but Zach Galifianakis did very much help change the narrative. Uh, the traffic to healthcare.gov shot up 40%. 90% of the people going to the website were people that had never been to the website before. Uh, and it was very much a game changer, and so. So uh, yeah. one of the things, that, Melvin, you're, you're I see you leaning in here, on, but particularly on this question of humor, and yeah. uh, as a way in for somewhat awkward conversations. I mean, there are so many. Uh, as a Chinese American, you know, I, I watch my family watches Fresh Off the Boat, uh, and every episode, you know, the discerning eye sees all of these subversive moments where yeah. you're dealing with issues uh, that could be combustible or very complicated, but uh, humor allows you to come at them in a, in a slightly different way. I mean, I think that's the key to all of it. Nobody likes to be, you know, spoon-fed or preached to. And I sort of think when you're laughing, you're just taking it in. And, you know, when he was talking about their website not working, I just immediately thought, well, Will Ferrell's website worked. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, that's kind of what we do on the show, basically. And we never really want to, you know, stand there and preach to people and turn... And, I mean, the key is entertaining, you know, and... You know, every season we tend to do something that is meaningful to somebody that's working on the show. And, you know, we opened it with the pilot episode dealing with the word chink, which to me was one of these things that we had to do. We had this chance. I didn't know if it was ever going to go to series, but I'm going to make a pilot with, that talks about it. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't, I made a pilot that dealt with it, you know? and. Um, you know, ABC at the time, Paul Lee was like, absolutely, we're going to let you say that word. It's not going to, we're not going to bleep it, we're not going to go, we're not going to sidestep it, let's just go for it. And, you know, uh, that to me was like the thing for season one. And season two, you know, R Randall Park and I talked about this in depth and with Notch, uh, who really wanted to do this too. Randall plays the dad. Yeah, and Randall the plays the dad, sorry. And, and um, Notch is the... Uh, uh, executive producer, creator of the show, and the greatest showrunner I've ever met. Um, we had an episode this past season called um, Good Morning Orlando, which sort of dealt with Long Duck Dong, which was a, a thing that most Asian American men <laughs> have at one point you know, dealt with it. And, Explain and, to the non-Asian non-men <laughs> uh, in the room. <laughs> Long Duck Dong is a very uh, popular character from John, uh, John Hughes movies. Uh, Getty Watanabe played him. And, um, if, 16, can 16 candles. candles, yeah. If you, uh, rem you may remember this sh scene where he's introduced. Molly Ringwald is sitting there and he kind of dips over and he has a bowl haircut and he says, what's happening, hot stuff? And, um, you know, it was a... So the classic Asian nerd who yeah, is kind a, of a, a male who is sort of desexualized and... Right. And, yeah. It was that stereotype. And we had to sort of talk about it in some way. And we did this episode where um, Randall's character can't want, it's deeply conflicted because he loves John Hughes movies, but there's this stereotype. And it, uh, it all sort of culminates in him going on a talk show called Good Morning Orlando, and he freaks out on the hosts when they you know, want him to just, just perform. And for me, that was like a way of talking about that stereotype, talking about that thing that we've all sort of dealt with, but in a very humorous way. And in the end of it, you know, we responded. We responded that it's not a, it's a stereotype we want to break. Mm -hmm. Rashad, what, what, I mean, what, one of the things about, um, you know, y you've been pushing against negative stereotypes, and so when you succeeded in getting uh, the show Cops off the air, uh, I mean, you, you, you started that campaign because Cops was week in, week out, showing African Americans as nameless, faceless perpetrators yep. of crime who were getting shoved into the back of uh, police cars and so forth. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things that, 
is interesting about the topic of narrative generally is that you know, it can be very subjective after a while. Like, this is my story. I'm going to tell mm -hmm. my story, right? Part of what you all have been doing at Color of Change also is letting people know the facts as well, right? The actual facts of what's happening uh, uh, on uh, voting rights, for instance, on, on, on other issues, so that it's not only uh, entertaining or attention-grabbing storytelling, but it's also uh, a, a bit of um, context setting and reality check, right? Absolutely. I mean, when, we, when you move into these moments, you know, our theory is that we have to give someone something clear to do. And so how are we leveraging the stories that are already out in the world, the things that people are already seeing them and connecting them to something that makes sense for, their, for the future, for what they can do? And how do we create an opportunity for allies to engage as well, those folks who are not black but are seeing these moments and want to um, engage? And that's, that is the, the larger theory. The thing about stereotypes, we used to have this um, thing at GLAD that we used to say that really has helped me as we think about sort of the wide range of images facing black folks and how do we ensure that we're not just playing respectability politics, but we're ensuring that there's a wide range of views and an intersectional approach. And people would always ask us about the character um, Jack on Will and Grace. It was a sort of stereotype and they would always say, well, don't you hate Jack, don't you hate the character Jack, don't you find, we were like, if you ask, you know, 10 gay men what they think about um, Jack, you know, four will hate him, four will love him, and two will be him. And um, <laughs> that is, um, that is like, so it's not a question of like completely breaking stereotypes, but it's about changing the incentive structures inside of entertainment so more of our stories get told. Mm -hmm. So that more, a, a deeper and more fuller array of representation so that folks yeah. are not going back to the same type of well, because that doesn't build the type of humanity and understanding. And it just doesn't impact sort of how black people see themselves, right? It impacts how decision makers yeah. see black folks. And we've seen all of from our research around people getting more time at, at um, you know, people getting less time from doctors, people getting less time from their teachers, people being treated differently by their jury. So this matters not just in terms of what we're seeing, you know, at eight o'clock or nine o'clock when we're sitting around with our families. It has real world implications for how people get to experience the world. And it also, these experiences and these conversations, that, converse, that character in, in 16 Cap Candles per, also prevents us from having the type of conversations yeah. you know, interracially in our society because it, it leads to a, a way of people engaging that is not helpful, not informative, and, and doesn't bring us to the sort of levels that we want to be at. You know, you used two <clears throat> phrases there in, in, in passing that I think are really worth uh, sitting with for, with for a moment. One is respectability politics. Uh, and the other intersectionality, right? And, uh, you know, Brad, I think, you know, so the, the currency of funny or die, of course, is satire, humor, uh, ridicule, so on and so forth, right? Um, uh, and, you know, one of the things that's been interesting about um, your all's work, particularly as you've been expanding the political dimensions of the work, I mean, it's not just great Will Ferrell gags and, you know, a f funny thing. But, but there's you know, a lot of those. There's there. a lot of those. <laughs> um, uh, is an interesting way in which one of the ways to break the frame of respectability politics of as a member of a uh, minority group, I'm, I'm going to want to present a certain way and angle myself so that I can be seen respectable to the majority, right? One of the ways to subvert that is just through ridicule and humor and so on and so forth. Uh, but the other piece that Rashad said about interracial and intersectional approaches with the young generation that you are, that, that is the audience of funnierdie.com, on the one hand, it's the most diverse generation in American history, right? Yeah. On the other hand, um, we heard a statistic yesterday in, in conversation uh, about how 70% um, of white millennials have never had a conversation with their family about race, right? Yeah. Uh, and so there, you can look at that a couple of different ways. Either people, young people just assume diversity or you can look at it as they, diversity is there and yet they haven't been encouraged through vehicles of pop culture to talk about it, right? How do you all try to get this younger generation to engage? Yeah, I mean, we do it through through comedy. And, you know, I, I work for a comedy company, so I clearly have a point of view on the power of comedy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a little bit of what Melvin, a little bit of what Melvin said with the power of, in my opinion, comedy is a last refuge of accountability. Um, you know, back in the day, we used to, we used to hold up our rock stars as, as the speaking truth to power. Um, that is long since passed. 
Uh, and it really is on the shoulders of, of comedians. And it goes back as far as even Shakespeare, right? It was mm -hmm. the, the comic fool in Shakespeare's plays is always the person who has the most power in speaking truth to power. And um, we do see this, uh, this generation, uh, and we're doing a lot of creative now for a lot of institutional players in Washington. So not just funny things for funny people, but um, really doing creative campaigns to move the country forward. Like, like what? Give an example or two. I, I don't want to name partners, Eric. I don't want to break news. <laughs> no, but you know, nonprofits, foundations, advocacy groups, but this generation is not down with attack ads. Yeah. This generation is not down with, with disparaging the person, uh, li putting down a person to lift yourself up. This generation is not down for that. Mm -hmm. They are down for truth and accountability. And so Donald Trump, I'm not sure if you guys have seen the John Oliver. Um, just the greatest takedown of all time, but it, it's an incredible takedown. Not only is it, is it just speak truth to power, but it is hilarious. Um, and that is the intersection of, and, and the, really the power in satire, in ridicule, is that one, to, to Melvin's point, it entertains, but two, when you are laughing, you are never more yourself than when you are laughing. All of the preconceived notions, all of the barriers, all of the things that you come to, those wash away and you are truly yourself when you're laughing. You're, everything washes away and those are the opportunities where a new idea can be presented and you're open to new thoughts. And I think my father is an African-American Vietnam War veteran who before Donald Trump was considering voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> so this is, this is the type of power that, that I believe that, that comedy, uh, comedy, he's gonna be very embarrassed I said that publicly. By <laughs> well, the way. Uh, on the other hand, Melvin has a great idea for a new sitcom yeah. about your dad, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's all uh, you have to. <laughs> well, we could have this conversation uh, all day long, but I just uh, w wanna say in closing, um, you know, two things. Number one, the ways that each of you is going about doing this uh, I hope all of you are feeling like you don't have to be a showrunner. You don't have to run a, a, a you know a, a major website. Uh, you don't have to run an, a, a giant advocacy organization to take these elements and strategies and ideas uh, into the way that you operate in the world on whatever your issues are. Uh, but recognizing you know the the core humanity of what uh, Brad was saying about you're never more yourself than when you're laughing. Uh, but also recognizing the ways that uh, Rashad was describing that. Um, stuff that we just pass by as the cultural wallpaper, the way that for a quarter century people just flicked past or maybe sat down and watched cops um, uh, to see with new eyes and to ask ourselves, is what we see reflective of who we are? Uh, and if not, what's my part in changing that story? Please join me in thanking Brad Jenkins, Rashad Robinson, and Melvin Martin.